turn to Judges chapter 4, if you would. Judges chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. I may ask somebody else to read it because I can distract you with my reading. So who, who would like to read that for us today? Okay, Russ, go ahead. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lithoel, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abraham, out of Kadesh, Napoli, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of, of the children of Napoli, and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto you the river Kishna, Sisera, and captain of Jacob's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee. Notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went back, went with Barak to Kadesh. Shall we give him a hand for doing that? Wow, all them big fancy names. And he did it with his teeth out. Can you imagine what he could do with his teeth in? <laughs> Um, yes. We know a lot about Deborah. If we'd be exact, we have a group that's been meeting. Um, we call them Deborah's Daughters. And uh, they met last night and uh, had a dinner and so on in a special time of looking at their spiritual gifts. Um, I forget when God brought this to me, but um, Deborah was a prophetess. And uh, what she would do is she would sit under the tree and they would bring people to judge situations like with Moses. That's what Moses did. And she would discern between right and wrong and sin and so on and so forth. However, God gave her a message one day for uh, Barak. And Barak evidently was head of the army. Or God was making him head of the army, and he says, Has not God called you to go to war? And Barak's response was, what? I will only go up if you go up with me. Um, and thinking about this and looking at it a little bit, um, it's interesting that Eric, I mean, Barak didn't feel qualified or adequate to do the job. And speaking to men today, how many of you feel inadequate to do the job most of the time? By the way, I don't know if that's such a bad place to be. <laughs> uh, and in, in Barak's case, he said, I will go up, Deborah, if you will go with me. And she said, however, listen, they're going to say that I, a woman, delivered the children of Israel, not you. So she wasn't striving for a position. She wasn't striving for notoriety. She was simply saying, this is what God said, and if you won't go up without me, I want to see us have, because they've been oppressed for 40 years. And God was saying, today's the day for deliverance. And so she said, I will go up with you nonetheless, uh, even though you, so that you will go. Um, I, one of the things I do appreciate about Deborah is she wasn't striving for, for a position. She wasn't striving for notoriety. Um, she was 
uh, just wanting to see God's will done. Um, there are often times, especially in this generation, where men struggle with adequacy, especially they don't feel very spiritual. How many of you men feel real spiritual? And if you feel that bad in church, just think how bad it is when you get out there, okay? And uh, feel pretty inadequate. I believe part of that is uh, a demonic attack against you and who God has called you to be and who he's made you to be, okay? And uh, trying to keep you from, from becoming who God wants you to be. And I want to speak to that, to, to that this morning. The last time I spoke, which was forever ago, how many of you realize it was forever ago? Yeah, I mean, James has taken over, Mike's taken over, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a has-been. So, to, to, to today, today I, I'm going to preach three messages in one <laughs> to empty seats. <laughs> But the last time I spoke, if you, any of you remember, uh, let me read what I said. When we were talking about God is good, I said this. Some things can only be understood when they are mixed with faith. I want to say it again. Some things can only be understood when they are mixed with faith. Can we turn to Hebrews chapter 11? I'm going to read one verse, and then we're going to turn one more place, and then we'll stay there for a while. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I know most of you have phones. You're already there waiting for me, okay? Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this. By, no. Did I write the right verse down? Here's what it says. For without, oh, yes, there we go. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, him who is referring to God. For he that comes to God must, what? Believe Believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them which diligently seek him. You see, faith is believing that God is, and that he rewards those to seek him. Okay? Without faith, we'll receive nothing from God. How many of you believe that God exists? Okay? Awesome. There we go. How many of you know that he rewards you when you seek him? I don't know about you. Sometimes it's half mask. Um, and so... I think there's a lot of men that believes there's a God, but questions whether God can speak to them, through them, by them. They can hear God's voice, whether they can do. And like Balak, instead of stepping up and stepping out in faith, they have a tendency to step back and say, let my wife, and I'm talking to fathers today let my wife do it she's far more spiritual than I am any guys ever felt that way yeah okay um, and I hope your wife is spiritual <laughs> thank God for a spiritual wife quite frankly as I've looked at this uh, Balak had the ability I mean I'm there you go. Barak. Bar- Barak. I'm sorry. I keep saying the wrong name. Barak had the ability to lead an army. Deborah had the ability to hear from God. Not a bad combination, right? All it is was, unfortunately, he stepped back from his responsibility to lead and gave that to Deborah. And I believe there's lots of us fathers and husbands and men who have a tendency to do that because we don't feel very spiritual. Might might, might I say to you this morning, spirituality is not a feeling. 
Because the verse we read, it says, by faith, that is, it is believing that there is a God and that he will reward those who seek him. So basically, it's believing in God and seeking him. I know a whole lot of women who have talked to me and said, I wish my husband would lead. Might I say, and we're going to talk about what leadership is and what it's not for a little bit today. Uh, And one of the things I have to say to the women that do that is, dear ones, if you're going to let that, if that's ever going to happen, you're going to have to step back and trust God to lead your husband. Okay? Listen, well, my wife, you, most of you know my testimony. We were separated for six months, uh, umpteen thousand years ago. And thank God it's umpteen thousand years ago. Okay? And, and, and you know what? When we got back together, my wife was submissive to me because she trusted God, not because she trusted me. Oh, what a good place to be in. And you know what God did? God changed me and made me the man that she needed. All right, let's turn to Ephesians. Well, at least we're, we're, when you guys get real quiet, you know what I've learned about you? That you're actually thinking about what I'm saying. So that's encouraging to me. Let's turn to Ephesians, and we're going to spend the rest of our time in Ephesians, okay? Okay. Ephesians chapter 5, verse, I want to start by reading verse 21. He says, Paul says this, Paul wrote this, and he says this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. By the way, he's introducing, talking about a husband-wife relationship. It's interesting, he starts off by saying what? It's a two-way street. He says, submitting yourselves one to another. That means the wife submitting herself to the husband, and the husband submitting himself to the wife. Now, I've heard lots of teaching on this that is so ludicrous, okay? And it's so far out there, put on by some male chauvinist who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Because it talks about who Jesus is and how he is. And it starts off by saying to us, listen, wife, submit to your husband. Husband, submit to your wife. What is it saying? There's a lot of women... um, let, let me, I wrote something down while I was reading this. Let me read it. There is no inferior or superior sex. Okay? Now, if I, I, I have a title to this. I didn't give it to begin with because, but I will at this one. Uh, my title is Man Up. Okay? That's my title. However, What I mean by man up is very different than what this world means by man up. Because God says something different. And he starts off by, Paul says this, there is no inferior sex or superior sex. So submit to each other. In other words, hear each other, care about each other, receive from each other. It's not a one-way street. And with the Balak, Deborah whole deal, it would have been fine except for he wouldn't have gone without her. That means that she was the one leading. Otherwise, it was probably a pretty good combination if he had been willing to step and lead. But he wasn't. So as we start this whole conversation, I want to say there is no inferior Sex. Now, let's read 22 through 24. He went on to say, 
It says, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be to their own husband in everything. And, and here's, here's what I want to say. There's some women that are sitting here and saying, not on your life. Okay? And, 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 and I understand why. There are some men in their idea of what a man is and a husband is. They think that the one that goes around and beats their chest and says, I'm the boss here. You're going to do what I say. And you are inferior to me because I'm the man. Well, let me tell you something. Real men don't do that. Real men don't feel the need to do that. It's insecure men that do that. And I'm sorry for the women that have been treated like they are inferior in the name of Christianity, saying the man is superior, so you, you, you can become a rug to his feet. And we're going to read what the rest of this says because it says something very the opposite. So anybody that teaches it and says, well, you need to become a rug to your husband, they have not read the Word of God. And that is not what it says. It says, submit to one another. There is no inferior or superior. And so I'm going to go back to the submit to one another to help us get the balance and get it right. Because I don't think it's a coincidence he started off because he knows how easily we can get off track. And yet he, he begins... With, uh, why submit to your husband? I want to skip that right now. And say, darn! Because you women all had your hands all fussed up and said, no, I'll tell you, boy. Okay? We're going to skip that for a minute. We'll be back to that. Can we go to verse 28? Um, let me see. I jumped. 25. Very good. Thank you. I'm finding my notes. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for the church. Let's talk to us men. And there's a lot of people, when I talk to single men, I... They say they want to get married. Okay? And here I asked them a question. Here is my question to them. So, are you ready to consider somebody else in every decision you make? Now, we have mainly women here today for whatever the reason. Must be it we got out that I was going to talk about this. Um, okay? Most guys, when they think they're in love, they're in heat <laughs> or lust. <laughs> and, 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 and all they are, and by the way, God made us sexual beings. How many of you know that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've talked to God about this before. I say, God, it doesn't seem fair that you give us such a powerful drive and, and say, now, handle it right. <laughs> Isn't that what he says? Eh. And he's the one that gave you sexual desires. So to have sexual desires is not sin. Okay? Now, to lust after a woman or man, by the way, it's not a one-way street. Just offhand, whether you know it or not. I'm, I'm in the real world. I deal with real people, and people talk real with me. Okay? It is sin to look at pornography and masturbate 
as if it's a real relationship. I know. I, if I sh- forgive me if you're offended with me being honest with you. Please forgive me. But we're going to talk real today, okay? Okay? Listen, that is sin because, listen, you're having sex with that woman in your heart and mind. And man, by the way, reverse it. That is sin. Because you're lusting after them, wanting to be sexual with them. And, and, and might I say, in, in our society at this point, I'm talking about 25 years ago, Dr. Dobson did a survey in an anonymous one, and it came back just to pastors, and 80% of pastors had some sort of problem with pornography, whether it be bathing suit pornography or outright, you know, vile films or whatever it is. They all had 80% of pastors. That's a big deal. That was 25 years ago. That's before pornography was on your phone. And, And you have to avoid it. I mean, you have to do everything in your power not to look at it. Okay? It used to be that pornography was a problem for less than uh, 25 or 30 percent of women. Let me tell you what it is today. It's almost up to at least 50 percent of women. Because, listen, the enemy is so trying to twist our sexuality. Because it is a powerful thing, and God wants it to be a powerful thing. You know why? Because God wants to raise up another generation of godly people. Okay? And by his grace, you can be sexually pure. Is that true? Okay. Just let, let's just get it out in the open and talk about, listen, sex outside of marriage is sin. Is that true? Now, now I've, listen, I had, I had a friend of mine, and I don't want to be prejudiced, but I had a friend of mine who taught at a Baptist seminary for black people. And he went in and talking about sex being sin. And they said, what are you talking about? You're teaching white man's doctrine. No, there is only one doctrine. There's only, listen, there is only one doctrine. And the word of God is the standard. And you can change the standard, but you'll pay a price for it. Do you hear me? You will pay a price for it. There is only one standard, and that is sex outside of marriage is fornication, or adultery, because if you have sex when you're married with somebody other than your spouse, that is fornication also. That is adultery also. Okay? So, any sex outside of the bonds of marriage is sin. Amen? I know you may feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be uncomfortable. I'm trying to set you free. Pardon? I just said nobody should be Well, listen... You can have, you know, like I say, I've talked to God about saying it's, it doesn't seem right that you should give us such a powerful drive, but he's also given us a grace to walk in purity. Do you hear me? God has given us a grace to walk in purity. And boy, in this society, you're going to have to make some pretty firm decisions if you're going to do it. You have to have a firm conviction that there, that is God's plan for your life, and you can do it by his grace. Otherwise, in our society, they uh, no, I, I talk honest with people, okay? And I've, I've been with young men, and they said, listen, that is old-time doctrine. They say, no, that was back for Jesus' day. Let me ask you what the, you know what God says about his word? He says, his word is eternal. When this earth is gone, he said, my word will still stand. Okay? Now, the good news is when we get to heaven, I don't know if it's good news, bad news, or indifferent. But when we get to heaven, Jesus made it real clear. Listen, we won't be married and we won't be having sex in heaven. Okay? Now, what does that, what does that look like? Okay, and I know I, somebody was telling me the other day, they said, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine, and they're in their late 60s, and somehow their daughter was talking, you know, it was talking to her and said, do you and daddy still have sex? And the mom said, yeah. She said, oh, I thought that was until you had kids. <laughs> well, God says, enjoy the wife of your youth. Nothing wrong with sex, by the way. 
If it's not in the confines of a committed relationship in marriage, nothing wrong with that. So anybody that thinks sex is bad, God came up with the idea. I can enjoy it. Okay. Now, okay. So, no, he says even just enjoy the wife of your youth. Sex can just be enjoyable too. Okay. In the right context. If it's not, something's wrong. No, no, listen to me. If it's not, there's something wrong. There are some women that have been sexually abused. And they need to, by the way, God wants to heal that. If you've been sexually abused and you can't enjoy sex with your husband, God wants to heal that. Okay? So, so, I mean, if, if you, for me, if I can't please my wife, I, I, I don't want to have sex. Because my desire is to please her. By the way, vice versa. And so, if my wife isn't going to enjoy it, I'm not going to do it because it's not enjoyable. And there's some women, some context that, you know, they have a selfish husband who wants to abuse them and, and all they think they are is a machine and it has nothing to do with love and intimacy and care and, and uh, so on. So, where am I? How did I, how did I get there? How did I get there? I would I wasn't even going to talk about that. That wasn't where I was going today. So evidently, I believe God wants, wants me to go there. Okay. It says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Listen, sex is not love. Uh, I'm going to go back there one more time. Sex is not love. Sex is lust. And by the way, it's okay for me to lust after my wife. It's good. By the way, good. I'm surprised more women aren't saying amen. But hey, Whatever. <laughs> Okay? Husbands, love your wife. It's not about sex. It's about caring about them. Like Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He laid down his life for the church. Now I can go back and... I've I've talked to... You know, I started telling you. I've talked to young men where they've said... Okay? Um, But they said, well, really... You know, I realized after they talked to me, I said, are you ready to consider them every decision you make? They say, no, really, I'm just wanting to be sexual with them. And they're honest, they're willing to be honest with me. They're saying, and I say, hey, God gave you your sexuality, but you know what? It needs to be in God's context. And I say, so if you're not ready to consider them in every decision you make, then don't get married. Learn to control your lust by the grace of God. Because by the grace of God, you and I can control our sexuality. You probably aren't going to be able to do it in your strength. Because outside of breathing, outside of breathing, it's a real driving force for men. Okay? For women, it can and cannot be. There's lots of different varieties and so on. So, love your wife means Jesus laid down his life for you and I. And that means die to yourself. So, when I got married, let me tell you, I got married because I was tired of being alone. However, it was still because of I wanted her to meet my need. That's called selfishness. That's not love. And so, it caught up with me after five years. And I left her because I, she wasn't satisfying me and being what I wanted her to be. Now, God dealt with that six months later, and he turned it all the way around, okay? Um, but, but, but listen, God's saying, husbands, are you, you are supposed to be ready and willing to lay your life down for your wife. Right? Is that what he says? Uh, by the way, it, these, these couple verses here give you an answer to your marriage problem. Okay? There, 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 there's two, two statements that they say, listen, if you want to deal with your marriage problem and you're a man, you begin to love your wife. You accept her for who she is. Love is to accept somebody for who they are. 
I spent five years trying to get my wife to be like me because I was so good. Maybe there's a little bit of arrogance there, huh? Yeah, maybe. Just a little bit of selfishness and arrogance. After God dealt with me and brought me to the end of me and I went back to my wife, a year later I realized if she had become like me, I would have had no need for her at all because she was everything I was not. And I was everything she wasn't. And I needed her and she needed me. And that's what made us complete. So if you have somebody you say, just like me, we are going to get married because we're just like, God help you. (laughs) Yeah. And you take my wife. She loves, oh, it was on our trip. It was amazing to watch her. Okay, she had $250 in her purse. We get to the airport Every place in that airport, 6 o'clock in the morning, every place in the airport was shut down but one. She, you know what she did? She, got to, she went into that store and called my grandkids and said, all right, guys, you each get to buy one thing. And, boy, she was so happy. She was like she had just won a million dollars because my wife loves to give. You never guess what I'm like. I I am thrifty. That's a nice way of saying maybe tightwad or something like that. I'm careful with the money, money. She loves to spend my money. And she goes out and has a great time spending my money while I try to save money. Of course, we work through all those dynamics, by the way, in loving one another. Okay. And we find that balance because I need her. She, She says I would still have the first penny I saved. I'll tell you something. It was gone the day I got married. I, I had a savings account when we got married. I had a savings account. I went and looked at it. I still have it in my steel file because I take it out every now and then and say, by the way, do you see how quickly you spent that savings account? I, I, I thought that was my job. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> and she does a great job of it. Okay. Okay. Husbands, love your wife like Christ love the church. Listen, you're not ready to get married until you're willing to consider her in every decision you make and how it's going to affect her. And having sex won't solve the problem. There's a lot of people that they start having sex. Let me tell you something. That sex will only keep your relationship close for a short time. Them hormones will die. That, that, that driving force will die. And now you are stuck with each other. In our society, you aren't you just go to the next guy, the next woman. Okay? God says that's sin too. Okay? Just, just to let you know. And, and, and it's death. Okay? The reason God hates divorce because it destroys people and destroys families. He doesn't hate divorcees. He hates divorce. Okay? And divorce brings death. Okay? Does it happen and people get, yeah, there's, you know, there's people that are unfaithful and, 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 you know, eventually you say enough is enough and you draw a line and they break that line and say, you got to go. And, and unfortunately, and fortunately, I believe God permits remarriage under those circumstances. Okay? Unfortunately, it happens. Let me, I have never talked to somebody about divorce. Well, he said, it's the best thing that happened to me. If they say that, I know the problem was them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If they say, that's the best thing that happened. No, real divorced people are hurting and wounded and aching and say, I gave myself that person, I entrusted myself that person, and they violated that trust. Okay? So, no, divorce hurts. And it hurts kids. It destroys kids. It destroys family. God hates it. He loves divorce. He, and, and, and if people will listen to what I'm saying this morning, it will save you some problems. Amen. Amen. Okay? It's just like purity until the day of marriage. Let me tell you something. It will save you some problems. I spend plenty of time ministering to people, and, and I talk to them, and, and I, 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 one of the first things I do when they're having marriage problems, and, and, and there's jealousy, I say, were you sexually involved before you got married? And without fail, it's yes, I was. And I say, well, they have every reason not to trust you because they know what you did with them. 
why wouldn't you do that with somebody else when it gets old with them? So Satan uses your sin against you. And we need to repent. And I do. I have them repent, and we go through the process and ask forgiveness and to God and each other. And, and, and you know what God is? He's a redeeming God. <laughs> He's a redeeming God. He can redeem the most broken thing in the world. He can redeem it and make it beautiful again. Amen? I, I'm a testimony, by the way. I'm a testimony of that. Okay. Have I got, is my time up already? I haven't even got started. Let's go on. Can we go on? Uh, yes. Have I done enough meddling for one day? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go for a few more minutes. Let's go for Okay. Verse 25, it said, Husband loves your wife and Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it and wash it with the water by the word, that it might present to itself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything that should be holy without blemish. Okay, um, and it finishes by saying, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. Okay, I'm going to go back and look at those other verses later on, but let, let's go to 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Listen, he that loves his wife loves himself. Listen to me. Men, if you want a good marriage, love your wife. Amen. Yeah. And that means accept her for who she is and want what's best for her. Amen? That's what it says. Okay? So husbands, love your wives because you're loving yourself. I, I, by the way, I said there's two things that it says that we are marriage problems. Husbands, love your wife. Let me tell you the other women. If you're having a marriage problem, I'll tell you something. The Bible says to honor your husbands. Submit to your husbands. I, I, let, the reason my wife and I are back together today, first of all, because she prayed and my mom prayed and God dealt with me. But listen, let me tell you what my wife did. She began to honor me. Not because I was worthy of the honor, but because God said, honor your husband. And that is to attach value and worth to. Listen, every time you talk bad about your husband, you are destroying your marriage. Wives, submit and honor your husbands. It is to attach value and worth. Let me tell you what I couldn't resist. You know what? When we were separated, my wife offered to wash my clothes for me. And I had left her. And when I went back, she submitted to me because she had submitted to God and said, God, I trust you. I don't trust that dog. But I trust you. And I'm going to submit to Roy and I'm going to do what he asked me to do. And... and we worked it through. By the way, God was dealing with me. Okay? God was dealing with me. And God did deal with me. Our first six months back together, we went to bed at 8 o'clock so we had time to talk. And we would talk sometimes for an hour or two, working things through. And I decided, if I'm going to be with her. I only went back because God said I couldn't have him with her. So I went back, not because I loved her. Best thing could ever happen because I did it because I loved God. Ooh. Safest place you'll ever be is when your man loves God or your wife loves God. Safest place because I'm there for him, not you. So it doesn't matter what you do or don't do because I'm there for him. Safest place, stupid. People say she's stupid to take me back. Okay? She probably was. I don't know. But anyway. Okay. But, but, you, but listen to me. There's something a man cannot resist. And that is a wife that honors him. In spite of his behavior, honors him. So, if you want your marriage to work, one of you got to decide who's going to finally do it. 
What guy is going to finally actually love his wife on condition, accept her for who she is and, and, and want the best for her? Or who is it that's going to honor and submit and, and, and love her husband in spite of himself? question is, who's going to do it first? If neither ever does, you know, you'll probably never have a good marriage. It's that simple. And if you don't want a good marriage, that's too bad because I believe marriage can be the best thing that you ever had. Yeah. Now, it took me a year once I went back to my wife to get things. No, first six months, my wife would cry a lot. She's, she's a woman she, or whatever. And she would cry. When we would talk, she would cry. And when she got in time, I'd say, okay, now we're going to pick up where we left off. Didn't change what I was going to say or do. Um, and and I, I, I can remember a budget. I mean, money's, you know, she likes money. Right? And I remember, going through the, I remember going through the budget deal. And, man, we tried five different budgets trying to, and, and, and we talk about it and say, yeah, but I, I see, I, here's, here's all the receipts and, and all this stuff. And we went through all that stuff. And, um, and finally, after, but she would cry. I remember less than a year later, my son coming up to me saying, Daddy, why are you and Mommy always laughing in the bedroom Because Jesus helped us. And Jesus healed our marriage. And only Jesus could do that because we surrendered our will to him and said, we're going to do it your way. No husband who doesn't love his wife, you're hurting yourself. I was hurting myself. Let's read verse 29. It says, For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it as the Lord does the church. What are we supposed to do? Love and nourish your wife as if it were you. I want to challenge because I, I, I know as I talk about some of this stuff it, it seems like an impossibility if you're in a tough situation um, but it's not an impossibility because grace is God given desire to do God's will and I'll tell you something God will give you grace God will give you grace. And by the way, for men, looking at pornography or bathing suit stuff is the most greatest insult you can give your wife. To take a second look at some other woman is the greatest and by the way, one of the things I realize is that I'm tempted to take a second look. By the way, I can think somebody's pretty, but I don't have to lust after them. Amen. And taking a second look is when you probably go into lusting. Okay? And you know what? Second looks aren't permissible for me. And by the grace of God, I don't have to take them. Okay? I thank God. God kept me from pornography. I never got caught up in pornography. But I tell you something, there's no greater addiction. Drugs are nothing compared to pornography. Because I've walked it through with men. And, and the enemy wants to tell you, you'll never get free. It's not true. I'm telling you, I know people who are walking free of pornography today. It, yes, you probably aren't going to get through it on your own because you're going to have to have somebody stand with you and do war with you and challenge you and pray with you and intercede with you. But I'm telling you something, you can get free of pornography, men. Yeah, you can get free from it. You're not going to do it alone. You're going to have to get real humble and let somebody walk with you. But I'll tell you something. I'm no more righteous because I never got caught up in pornography because I have my stuff I have to deal with too. I just thank God I never got caught up in that because that's worse than any drug you can imagine. And it distorts your whole view of the other sex and what their purpose is and, and how it goes. And, and you begin to think it's all about you, and it's not. It's about you pleasing them. It's not about them pleasing you. Ooh, meddling, huh? 
Okay. I, I would like to ask the men who are here today to, to memorize the verse of Hebrews 11.6. Would you please do that? I'm going to quote it one more time. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek, seek him. Listen. If you want to become truly spiritual, it's knowing that God exists and begin to seek him with all of your heart. It's not a feeling. It's a decision to say, God, you know what? I'm going to start seeking you with all of my heart. Because you've called me. Listen, there's a lot of people that think being the man is that it's all about them. That is not what it's about at all. It's all about you laying your life down for your wife and your family. Okay? And they don't feel very spiritual. Most men don't feel spiritual, and they step back, and the women feel like they have no choice but to take over. And they do what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? And it starts. Can can I recommend? I want to ask... The married men today. Let, let me tell you how to lead, to start leading. How about with every decision you take in and go on to your wife and say, can we pray together about this? Amen. And you being the leader. Amen. You as a man being the leader and say, can we pray about this? Yes. It's not you beating on your chest. I make all the decisions around here. It's the way I... No. No, it says submit yourself one to another. Okay? And so what do we do? As a leader, as you as the leader of the home and the family, it is a responsibility that you and I will give account to God for one day how we did it, men. Let's do it God's way. Let's say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking and talking about this, and honey, can we pray about this thing? You better look out because you guys are going to start getting close about the time you start doing that. And that's being a leader. It's not beating on your chest and dictating. It is, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to be the spiritual leader that God's called me to be, and I'm going to come together with my wife, and we're going to seek God together about the stuff that's going on that we need to deal with. Amen? Okay? I, I want to challenge. Listen, you married men... To make the determination, you're going to become that spiritual leader. And let's start it by praying with our wives at least once a day. Can we do that? Can we do that? Once a day. And it's about all the things that you've been thinking about or struggling with or hasn't been going on. And sit down and say, hey, this is this what, you know, where I'm at. Can we pray about this thing? Your wife will get freaked out to begin with. What is happening to my husband? You know what's happening? You're becoming the spiritual leader you're called to be. It's not a feeling. It's realizing I'm going to take responsibility one day for how I deal with these things, and I want my wife's input. Any, let me tell you something. Anybody that doesn't want their wife's input is a fool. Because you're, if you hurt her, you're hurting you. Did you hear me? If you hurt her, you are hurting you. So why wouldn't you want her input? And she is everything you're not. And you may not like her saying, no, you can't spend that money. It's not in the budget. By the way, there's some fallacy out there that thinks that if you're the leader, then you have to run the checkbook. Good heavens, do not give a checkbook to a guy that spends all the money. It's who is best at doing that. Okay, And I've heard these teachings, and boy, people have really messed their life up. No man, if, if a guy can't keep a checkbook, why are you going to let him handle the money? Right? Amen. And we need to be humble and say, hey, you're good to keep. By the way, my wife was not good at keeping the checkbook. For years, I took, the, took care of the checkbook. Finally, I realized if I died, my wife 
knew nothing about doing checkbook. It took me two years to get her to be able to balance a checkbook. Well, most of the time. <laughs> okay? I mean, she knew how to balance checks just like she knew how to balance a basketball. I mean, she had about, okay. Look at what you have to look forward to, man. I mean, uh, it is. It's, it's exciting. I took the check when we got tight fight. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. I, I want to teach you men something. We went through a tight period in our life, and my wife was taking care of the checkbook. You know what I did? I took away the checkbook and gave her an allowance each week. So she, no, so she didn't have the stress of the finances because she doesn't need to care of that stress. Because I loved her. I said, no, this isn't your stress. I had her learn how to do the checkbook. I took it back for, I don't know, a couple, three years when we were going through a tight period. And I carried that. It's not that we didn't pray about finances. I carried that responsibility. And as long as she had that money to spend, she felt comfortable. Listen, real men lay down their life for their wife and their family. Real men do. I know in the world is something else. They think it's how many women they can have sex with and all. That they ain't a real man. Jesus was a real man. Never had sex with a woman once. He was a real man. He shows us what a real man does. A real man lays down his life for his wife and his family. And there's no greater joy. Listen, until you learn the joy of giving, you'll never have joy. As long as you make it about you, you will never have joy. So, once again, that's what real men do. Okay? And, and, and my, my, my statement is, men, let's man up. What, what do you say we man up? Yes. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's, let's man up. Okay? And, and, and be the men that God's called us to be. And lay down our life for our wives and our family. Does that mean that the woman can just do whatever she wants? No. Not at all. A real man will say, no, that's not good for our family. In other words, we're not going to go into debt. No, no, that's not good for our family. No, we aren't going to do that. That's being a good leader. By the way, not after you go and buy a boat. (laughs) No more spending. (laughs) (laughs) You hear what I'm saying? Okay, right? Not after buying a boat. You don't say no to her. But you get rid of your boat and get back where you belong. I know I've done a lot of meddling today. I want, listen, men, listen, don't believe the lie of the evil one. You can be spiritual. It's just believing that God is, and he says, seek him in each situation with your whole heart. And he will direct your paths, and he will bless you. You will have a life. You will have a wife that just adores you. I have a wife that adores me. I, I, I call it Twitter-pated. It's as if she doesn't even see my faults. I mean, you, you, I don't have many, but. <laughs> no, that's what love does. It accepts somebody for who they are and wants what's best for them. Can, can I pray for grace today for you? Yes. Father God, once again, I, you sent Jesus to show us how to do this. <laughs> And how he gave his life, how he laid it down, how he gave up all the glories of heaven and, and all that and, and, and chose to fall, come into our world and relate to us because we're his bride to be. And he loved us and died for us and went to hell for us. And he said that Christ in the church was an example of what marriage is supposed to be. Now, God, we, we realize that we, we can't do that in our own strength. So we come to you today and say, will you give us grace? Holy Spirit, will you speak to us? Will you lead us? Will you guide us? Will you empower us? Will you give us the right heart that would love to do that? And as you do, we will give all the honor and the glory and the praise to you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Yes, James. There's a mic. Here, no, here it is. I'm sorry. It's right here. Okay, just one moment. I know it's run a little late. I don't normally do this, but I want to 
just make it known because of things that are going on in our country and even in the world today, how quickly we are to take offense many times, and especially anything that's said regarding race. We don't believe in race here at New Life. We believe that we're all a part of the human race. You made a statement uh, in your message about this guy speaking at the black church, and they said about this was, you know, a white man's doctrine and all. Let me just offer this for what it's worth, okay? Because when I, during the time, the four years or whatever that I was gone, I was reminded of a lot of stuff like that. I, don't, I guess I'm saying this because I don't need anybody standing and defending us that, Pastor Roy, you shouldn't have said that or that was not right. No, it is prevalent because one of the churches that we, were, we went to, you had a guy sitting in, that sits in the pulpit. He, he and another woman were living together unmarried. And when I said something about it, it was like, what are you talking about? You know, God knows our heart and all. No, that's wrong. There is no, that's not a white man's doctrine. That is the Bible. The Bible declares that man and woman living together unmarried and having sexual relationships and all, that is sin. So, brother, I just want you to know I'm in agreement. I'm in total agreement with what you would, not just that. But everything that you said today, I'm in agreement with it. And I just want to know, we don't need anybody defending us against that. That was not a racist statement and all. That was truth. And I experienced it myself during the time that we were out, some of the places that we went, that is still a prevalent part even in the church that this is acceptable. But no, it is not. So I just want you to know, want everybody to know I'm in total agreement with what Pastor Roy shared about that, and we do not need to be defended for it. 